Kevin Bond is coming for you again at this morning to thank you for the privilege of knowing Mr. Turo, knowing mom, grandma, aunt, and the life and testimony that she left me behind that it was for the oncoming generation loving you and serving you. We pray that you might just bless this service to your honor, to your glory. Not to lift up the church, but to lift up Jesus Christ and your salvation, but also remembering with honor of our God. And may we weep together Just giving the order of the service we have in the bulletin of the program. Um, we will be having the congregational song uh, next. And led by Anthony Miller, the grandson of the church. And the page numbers that you have there, I will sing you a song, the page number 5, 76. I have it in the Christian hymn. 
Kimberly. <coughs> and one friend we have in here who was also in the Christian community based in 160. And if you don't have access to Christian community, the Philip Bond and Joe Cole. The city will be called by the devotional by Wayne Bell, the grand son of the Christian the son of law of the Norman. Then following that, there will be a message by Elmer Yoder, a minister from Pleasant View, the church that the church was a member at. Then there will be the reading of the obituary, a poem in the obituary by Anthony Yoder again, my grandson of the church. And following that, we'll have the reading. Let's worship the Lord together as we sing 576. I will sing you a song that is found in the Black Hymnal, and we'll sing the tune that we find in that. Five, seven, six. <clears throat> Thank you. 
time to think about our own life. And that we look back. But then we also look forward to as well. I didn't know when to mention this, but I think I'll mention this right away here before I forget it. But many, many years ago, when one of the friends' daughters was young, Grandma wrote a, an autograph in her autograph book, and this is what she wrote. It's probably at least uh, 35 years ago when she wrote this, but this is what she wrote. Remember me when I am gone and laid beneath the sod. Remember that your grandma has gone to live with God. I think we can think about that today. We trust that she was ready to go. I want to read out of Mark chapter 14 some devotional thoughts and then also read some out of Matthew 25. But there's a there's something here that in Mark chapter 14 that I thought about and I just like to share this for some opening thoughts here. Mark chapter 14, verse 3, And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman, having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone, my trouble be her, she hath brought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come with a forehand to anoint my body to the variance. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. The words that were standing out to me this morning is in verse 8 where it says she had done what she could. You know, I had to think, I think the older that I get, the more I tend to look back on my life. And, you know, all of us can think of things that we wish we would have done differently or we have regrets and sometimes there's broken pieces in our lives and we don't really know you know, even what to do about it. And, and you know, we look back. And I, I had to think of this song. There's a song, a poem that says, talks about the time of toil being past and the night has come. And it's talking about the end of life. And, and how these reapers are coming back with their sheaves and they wonder if their sheaves are going to be accepted with God. Will God accept what I have done with my life? You know, that's a question for you and I today. You know, sometimes we will have that question in our minds. And I think it's good for us to think about it now while we have opportunity, instead of suddenly we may depart from this life and stand before God and not have time or opportunity to think about these things. But today we do. We have the opportunity to think. What is, is God? Will He accept what I've done in my life? Am I right with God? And there's a, I think that song concludes with the thought that, full oh, well I know that patient love perceives not what I did, but what I strove to do. And thou wilt accept my sheep. So, getting back to this phrase here. She hath done what she could. To me that speaks of somebody that has tried to do the best they could. They tried and it wasn't maybe much or it wasn't maybe something so famous or it wasn't something so glamorous. But it was just simply this, this, this woman here in Bethany in the house of Simon here she just gave the best that she had. That's what she did. She gave the best that she had. And you know, that's what I think about when I think about Grandma this morning. She has done what she could in her life. And you know, now it's up to you and I to go from there with our lives. Are we doing the best 
that we can. Are we doing what we know is right? Do we, and how do we know what is right? Well, we know what is right and what is wrong if we look into the Holy Word of God. And someday we may have the opportunity to leave here someday if we're faithful, if we're ready, if we've done what we can. Um, there were three, two other places, and both I, I thought of here in Matthew chapter 25, where it gives the, basically the same thought that someone that did the best that they could. And I think I'll turn to that. In Matthew 25, we have the parable of the talents and how this Lord gave unto some five and some two and some another one one. And then, uh, then he came back. He came back. And you know, there's this is something to remember. Someday, Jesus is coming again. And we will give an account for our life as well. And so the first one came to his Lord. And in verse 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. In other words, this is saying to me essentially the same thing that Jesus said to this lady when he said she had done what she could. This servant was just being faithful with what he had been given. You know, never think that you don't have something to contribute to the kingdom of God. Because each one of us, even if it's just a little thing, even if we can't do very much, if we're faithful in that, that is what God is looking for. And it, I think that those of us that would have known Grandma, we look back over her life and we can think of faithfulness in many things. And it blesses us today. We go on in this chapter. I will read in, uh, in, in verse, well, I'll start reading verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Again, I see these same words. She had done what she could. In a sense, being repeated here as the king speaks to those of the righteous here, he says, You know, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. And you took care of me. You took care of my need. And the righteous didn't even remember that. When was this done? And the Lord only knows how often that took place in Grandma's life. <coughs> but as inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me, is what he says. So the, the challenge that I find this morning, you know, as we reflect upon our life this morning, it's not so much how much we have. It's not so much how much ability we have or how much money we have. But it's more what are we doing with our life. What are we doing with the... What are we doing with that which the Lord has given to you and I? Are we being faithful in that which has been given to us? You know, it, it's something to be said. Uh, Grandma was lived, lived a long life, 90-some years, and she raised a 
family. And you know, we have many mothers here today with small children. And you know, you see, you can see the results of a mother's love and her training and care upon her children. You can see the fruit of that. But a lot of that takes place in the unseen to most people's eyes the events of everyday life. It's in the small things of life. It's being faithful, just doing what she can. And this goes for fathers as well, fathers and mothers, just doing what we can, being faithful, doing what we know is right. You know, if we go against what we know, against better knowledge, against the scripture, we can be assured that we will have to answer to God for that someday. But we need to continue on doing what is right to the best of our ability. She has done what she could. <coughs> may, may we, as we think today of continuing on with the service and the funeral and the burial and if we remember that, then we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. Death is not the end. We have a soul that will never, never die. And we trust that Grandma was prepared. She was ready to meet her maker. And we're glad for that this morning. And now it behooves us, those of us who are still here, to set our house in order. Because we don't know how long we have left. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be many years yet. But in the time ahead, you know, we can look back, but let's look, look forward. Let's do the best, give it our best for our Master, for the Lord, while we have the opportunity, while we have time. So I will conclude with that, and may the Lord bless the service for you. of victory. Victory in death. Leaving the scene of this life. Job said a few more years to come. And he said, I shall go whence I return no more. <coughs> we are here at the time where we face the last will and testament of the Torah Miller of her life on this earth. It has completed. She has crossed the finish line. As Paul said that I have finished my course. Her course has ended in this life. She was a lady, I believe, that fulfilled the words of the proverb writer in 31. She looked well to the ways of her household and didn't eat the bread of idleness. She was that type of a lady and fulfilling her household duties, I believe.
Though it's a blessing to go and stop in and visit a bit. But here we are today. Life is fragile, handled with care. That's why the Old Testament writer said like this, he said, prepare to meet thy God. May it not be like some that the one writer said like this. He said, I have done everything in this land, the course of this life, to prepare for this life. But he said, I did not prepare for death. He said, now I face the consequences. He left out the most important part of life, and that was to prepare for death. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Something that is precious is very valuable. And that's why I said that it's the death of his saints is very precious. And we know that God made provision for that through Jesus. When he was nailed on the cross and rose again, he is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in him shall never die. Believest thou this. But as life goes on, death is an enemy which under the providence of God has been turned into a blessing. An old preacher that's not here today anymore used to say like this, how would it be if you couldn't die? How would it be if you would live in a physical condition that would be so miserable and couldn't die? Something to ponder on and it's, it's very true. So he turned to one writer, turned it a blessing. One of the kindest things that God ever did when at the Garden of Eden, when he Garden of Eden, when he put up the flaming sword that man would not live in sin forever, and promised the Savior. Now it's for, up to us to make the right choice and choose the right path. And choose things in the light of eternity. For we must all pass through this way. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, he says, I am thy servant. Thou hast loosed my bounds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. The following verses of precious in the sight of the Lord, the death of his saints. I seek no reward in this life below. The songwriter says, but he says that payday will come when the burning gates unfold. The Christian life is not necessarily a life of roses, and Jesus reminded us of that. That the trials that he went through, he says, my followers will face the same. And he meant what he said when he said that. So death, as we look at death being so final, According to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, death is so final, but victory, there is victory in death. Because the trials of life, the hardships, the heartaches of life are over for the godly and the Christian people that have accepted Christ as their Savior and lived it out. As John tells us, 
He that believeth in me heareth my word, and heareth my word and believeth in me shall not come into condemnation, but he says is passed from death unto life. He has passed from death unto life. So there is another death that the Bible speaks about when man is transformed from the power of darkness to his marvelous light. That is, speaks of eternal life. He has passed from death unto life. Eternal life. That speaks of eternal life. Paul also said that he delivers us. He has delivered us from so great a death. Found in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 10. He has delivered us from so great a death, an eternal death. Not speaking necessarily of the physical death, but of eternal death. That he has delivered us from. We live in a time, beloved, that the call is urgent. The gospel call is very urgent. The battle is fierce for the Christian. We live in a world today like we have never lived before of so much unrest. We live in a world that is so unrestful in our government. But let us remind ourselves of the words that Jesus said that my kingdom is not of this world. Beloved, let us remind ourselves as we are faced with the one hand that has departed this life, that we are reminded again that death is sure. Death is final. They don't live, they don't all live to be 90 years old. No, they don't. People are passing on all ages of life. So the call is urgent. The call is urgent to the gospel for all nations. And that was what Peter preached at, the, at Cornelius' house when he said that in all nations he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. And I believe that to this very day, my beloved, we can be under the identification of whatever you want to be, Amish, Fiji, Horse and Buggy Mennonites, beloved, it doesn't matter. The gospel call that Peter preached was in all nations. He that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. And I believe that in the fearing God and working righteousness exceeds far beyond that identification of our name, so to speak here on earth to where we go to church and so on. That's what Jesus is concerned about. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Life is earnest and life is real. That's true. If the call is urgent, very urgent. And the battle is fierce. And not only that, the time is short. Time is very short, beloved. It doesn't take long to get you up to 65 and 70 years old. It doesn't take long. One day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Such life seems to be. There's a German writer. I have not forgotten my German. I still appreciate my German for that matter. And I, sometimes I like to quote this little verse. The Christmas loaf in Leben. Don't go to the house, there's all to see it one for all and sway and sign a guns and lay them slow. On a sunny coast for kite, they be monster shelf and tide, then monkey shay and his eyes, unkey shay and kept him on. How true that is. If man could only, the conscience doesn't awake until this time. All of a sudden the conscience wakes up, but it's too late. If he could only undo some things that took place. But he can't. And that's what that verse is telling us there. He cannot undo some things that he wish he could. The rich man was the same way. Oh, did he plead when he looked 
on the other side, but he seen Lazarus had many opportunities to help the poor man out. But, you know, his life was wrapped up Pharaoh sumptuously every day and dressed himself in fine linen. That was all temporary, my beloved. The day came when life, when things became real to that man. And he had to hear the words, Thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things and Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted and you live in hell. That was final for him. He was concerned, yes, he was concerned about his brethren. He wanted to be a missionary, so to speak. He said if they would know of one that rose from the dead, his brethren, they would hear. But he had to hear the words. If they didn't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe if he won't believe. Rose from the dead, they won't believe it. We live on this side of that, we have one that rose from the dead. That's why he said that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So we look at there again, we look at life, we need to remind ourselves every day, from morning to evening we don't know what may transpire and take place. Paul said in Philippians 1, 20, he said, oh that Christ would be magnified in my body. Oh, that Christ would be magnified in my body. And he says, whether by life or death, that's a challenge for me, I believe it's a challenge for us all, that Christ would be magnified in my body, whether life or death. He wants him real and magnified in his body. So it says, for me to live is Christ and to die is a gain. For me to live today is Christ and to die is gain. Because he believed in his Savior. He was anchored in his Savior, in Christ. That's where we need to be. We need to be anchored. And put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. That we would be renewed in knowledge after him that has created us. So life is fragile, handle with care. We need to handle it with care. Isaiah 40 verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Then it goes on, and mount up with wings as eagles run and not weary, walk and faint not. They shall renew their strength. Now I'd like to read a bit from taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward men perish and ages. Now, if you, I'm sure, <coughs> there's people here that have, seen, have not seen others for quite some time. 
And this goes back and forth. When you haven't seen someone for quite a long time, you know, that person probably has aged some. That's a process of life, aging. But it says here that though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. Is renewed day by day. There's not a one-time thing in this Christian life. It's a life that you exercise. It's a life that has to be exercised or will not be prepared for this day. You have to exercise the godly and Christian life. It has got to be renewed day by day. I kind of wonder what that poor, how else could you work that renewed thing? The dictionary calls it renovate. He called it renovate. When we done, having done a lot of remodel work over the years, when we re re renovate, we take out the old, we get rid of and we rebuild. We need to be rebuilding this Christian life constantly and work on it. It's not just a one-time thing. We got to rebuild. We got to get rid constantly. Paul said that uh, in my flesh, he said, well, it's no good thing. So he says, we must constantly be getting rid of, working on, keeping it out, getting rid of it. Rebuilding, renewing, he says. But yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's the Christian life, is renewing, renewing, and again renewing. For he says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, in comparison to eternity. He says, worketh for us far more an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Far more an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, now we're talking about faith. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, because he says, the things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen, your faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's faith. The things that are not seen are eternal. And that's what we need to be concerned about. This is not seeing is believing. Sometimes we'll use that term in my fear. But not in the word of God. Thomas was reminded of that. Blessed are they that don't see and yet believe. Wherefore, he says, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Why does he use the word labor? Whether we labor, labor is work. Labor speaks of something that is work. So he says, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That's a full-time job. There is no retirement in this Christian life in serving the Lord. Because in this life we have an enemy, the devil that seeks to devour and transforms himself as an angel of life. Only as we search the word of God will we pick up on that. Under knowing and understanding the word of God. Then he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether good or bad. That brings it down to a very personal thing. That brings
brings it down to me and you of those that have come to the years of accountability to search the scriptures. Knowing therefore, Paul says, he goes on to say, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He says we persuade men, but we are manifest unto God. And I trust also are manifest in your conscience. And I like the German, what it says there, if you was a German in a day, you'd probably hear, Bewile wir wissen, dass der Herr zu fürchten ist. While we know that the Lord is to be feared, the Bible also speaks of different fears. He says, perfect love casts out fear. When we love the Lord with heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, perfect love casts out fear. But we live also in a world today where there is no fear. We are to reverence and respect God, a type of fear. But too much of our people today in this world have lost the fear of God. It's hopeless. So knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, Paul said. We try to impress, we try to, 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 uh, can't get the word I want there maybe, we, we, Try to uh, instill it in people. Is what he is saying there. The time is short. And the call is heard. Another writer said like this. He said, as I mentioned, one provided in the course of his life for the will ever turn except death. The most important thing he left out. And now at last, I am to die entirely unprepared. Entirely unprepared. Another one said, Woe is me. He said, Woe is me. He said, When God called, I refused. When God called, He said, I refused. When He invited me, I made excuses. I made excuses when he invited me. He said, now I receive the rewards of my deeds. Now I receive the reward of my deeds. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me. Prepare to be thy God. He has opened the way for all of us. It's all through faith. It has to do with faith. Hearing, believing, and living. That's what John tells us. Hear, believe, and live. What does the songwriter write, the poet? What did he write? He said like this. It's a heart-touching message. He said, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but thee. And John taught us that in John 10. He that tries to get in another way is a thief and a murderer. He said, I am the way. 
He that goes in and out with me finds green pasture. Then he says, the songwriter says like this, I never get sight of the gates of light. If the way of the cross I miss, I never gain sight of the way of the light. If the way of the cross I miss, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Beloved, there's excuses, excuses. You remember in Luke 14, where the guests were invited and they made excuses and excuses. One bought some land. One, he said, I cannot come. Another said, I bought a yoke of oxen, I cannot come. Another said, I took a wife, I cannot come. Sad to say, he said, none of those. He said, go on in the byways and highways and call them in. He said, none of those that were invited shall taste my supper. So, beloved, it's up to us. Is, it, is life going to be real and earnest, or is it not? For those that don't accept Christ as their Savior, they will not taste his supper. Depart from me that work iniquity, I never knew you. The saddest words that one could ever hear is depart from me. So beloved, if we want to go to heaven, we must go by the way of the cross. There's no other way to glory. It is only by the way of the cross that man will ever enter heaven. The way, the truth, and the life. That's why the poet said that I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There is no other way but thee. There is no other way but him. There is another songwriter that gives us so much importance. He speaks of over yonder. He says over yonder. There will be no heartaches. Over yonder, there will be no heartaches. The rich man had the heartaches to the full max of his head. He missed the mark. He says, no lonely days will ever come. Or will be up there. There will be no crying, there will be no dying. Oh, what rejoicing when we get over there. Just over yonder, he says. He gave man the choice. That's why he put the flaming sword at the Garden of Eden. After the choice of transgression and evil, that man would not live in that state of sinfulness. So today, it's a choice. It's a choice for us. That's why Peter preached so clearly and said, in all nations, he that fears God and works righteousness. And Peter was a man who wasn't too sure that he should be doing all of this. But he was taught with the white sheet coming down, don't call things common. And Peter went forth for preach the gospel. That's where we're at today, beloved. We must needs go home by the way of the cross. The way of the cross isn't always the, the most pleasant life. It's the right life. It's the peaceful life. Yes, it is. He didn't promise roses in this life altogether. So, another thought 
is to think on the four last things so often. He reminds us the writer. You won't find these exact words in the Bible, but they're there in other words, in other words. Death, there is nothing more sure. Death is final. How will it be to die? Have you ever asked you that question? Keturah probably didn't say a lot in a way that death was close. Maybe she did. But as I sat there Saturday, I felt that she knows her time is close to expire here. She may not have said much. A body retaining fluid is a difficult way to go. It affects your respiratory. When it's bad enough, it comes to the lungs. Your body fills with fluid. And you work to breathe, to labor to breathe. And I'm sure that's what she had on the story. I've seen that in my wife as well. And I believe that she was waiting and ready to move on. Kultura had a lot of patience. She had a lot of patience. It'll be different in the house. Then would you go home? I like to encourage that God be with you. You walk in the house and everything remains just the way it was when you left. You come home, the house is empty. But when we trust the Lord, have we put our faith, we think and meditate upon God. It makes the whole difference. That makes all the difference. It is still not easy. It's still, it's difficult. But remember, Dan, that you won't, you're not the only one that has experienced this. That's the way I try to think. I must remember I'm not the only one that has experienced this. I was told, you know, by couples that, you know, one person told me like this, that, well, one of us is going to experience it. She had a companion. But one of us will probably experience it someday. Back in the beginning, he said, thou art dust. They to dust and unto dust thou shalt return. We all know that. But parting is hard. Parting is difficult. It's all right to cry and to shed tears. That's okay. There's something I believe 
there's something about mother that's special. That's very She loved her children. And she cared. She was noted for her good cooking, for making flowers. Good for making good flowers. I believe she left a good life for us. She was human. Yes, she was human. But I believe she left a legacy. It leaves many memories. Precious memories of the living. And those memories flood your soul. <coughs> they flood your soul. But that's all right. When we look at things through God's eyes, it makes all the difference. <coughs> so I wish you. And the children wish you God's blessing as you go from here. The Bible tells us that there remaineth a rest unto the people of God. There remaineth a rest unto the people of God. There's nothing that feels better when you're tired. And if you can, to lay down and rest, you can do that. Words can hardly describe that, how good that is. Keturah's body is laid to rest. Awaits the great day of the resurrection. When all God's people May you find grace and strength and courage in trusting and looking into the Word of God as you go through this. May God bless you.
especially as a grandson. I want my fellow grandchildren to listen from grandma. Help me. And I'm not here to see if the sun should rise and find your eyes all filled with tears for me. I wish so much you wouldn't cry the way you did today while thinking of the many things we didn't get to say. I know how much you love me. As much as I love you. And each time you think of me, I know you'll miss me too. But when tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called my name and took me by the hand and said my place was ready in heaven far above and that I'd have to leave behind all those I dearly love. And as I turned to walk away, a tear fell from my eye for all my life. I'd always thought I didn't want to die. I had so much to live for and so much yet to do. It seemed almost impossible that I was leaving you. I thought of all the yesterdays, the good ones and the bad. I thought of all the love we shared and all the fun we had. If I could relive yesterday, I thought for just a while, I'd say goodbye and kiss you and maybe see you smile. But then I fully realized that this could never be. Friendliness and memories would take the place of me. And when I thought of worldly things that I'd miss come tomorrow, I thought of you, and when I did, my heart was filled with sorrow. But when I walked through heaven's gate, I felt so much at home. When God looked down and smiled at me from his great golden throne, he said, This eternity and all I have promised you. Today your life on earth is past, but here it starts anew. I promise no tomorrows, but today it will always last. And since, since each day is the same day, there's no longing for the past. But though I promise no tomorrows on earth to anyone, so many live each day so sure of seeing one more sun. Yet each one knows that I will call and no one knows just when, but they never stop to pray and ask forgiveness for their sin. And many I have turned away, so sad at heaven's gate. For what I called, they weren't prepared, and it was much too late. But you, you have been so faithful, so trusting, and so true. Though there were times you did some things you knew you shouldn't do. But you have been forgiven, and now at last, you're free. So won't you come and take my hand and share my life with me? So, when tomorrow starts without me, don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'm right here in your heart. The tour of Iowa Wagner, Miller. Age 90, wife of Daniel L. Miller, entered into rest Sunday, October 13, 2019, at their home in Uniontown, Ohio, surrounded by her family. She was born in Montgomery, Indiana on January 4, 1929, to the late Harvey and Susanna Wagner, and is survived by her husband and six children, Walter Willow Miller of Minerva, Ohio, Norman Martha Miller of Root House, Illinois, Raymond Ada Miller of Uniontown, Ohio, Stephen Laura Miller of Chesterville, Ohio, Christina Sam Yoder of Taylorsville, North Carolina, <coughs> Dennis Kelly Miller of Uniontown, Ohio, 33 grandchildren, 82 great grandchildren, brother Rowan Wagner, and his sister, Esther Gainage. She was preceded in death by six brothers, one sister, and four grandchildren. The family wishes to express their thanks for the prayers, 
visits, support, and understanding through this time of mom's journey to glory. Wishing each one God's blessings and grace till we all meet together on the other side. <coughs> And also the new meal will be ready. We're going to go straight across into the fellowship hall and just the new meal is to be ready at the close of the service, at the close of the meeting. For those who are not going to the burial, um, to those who are going to the burial, uh, it's just north on Market Avenue and Southern View Cemetery. That's 1.2 miles from here. And you turn left as you go up the driveway. But we want you to line up behind the, uh, the casket, uh, behind the uh, vehicle that's taking the casket. And, uh, Follow that and have your lights on, four ways on, and you go up the road. <coughs> and also, because of the uh, forecast of rain, there is a tent there, though I'm not sure that it's even big enough for the family. Uh, but I think the rain is supposed to 